Good afternoon. I'm Shannon Derejo from Crema Media. Welcome to our webinar on local manufacturing, hosted in partnership with Electromining Africa, South Africa's biggest trade exhibition since 1972. Today's panel of speakers will unpack the strategies needed to turn around South African manufacturing. Our webinar today is sponsored by Nedbank, Shell, Siefsa, Actum, Donaldson, Hellerman Titan, Bova Safetyware, Stratus Technologies, Pipestar, and Rare Plastics. We thank them for their support in making this event possible. Before we start, please note that we've activated the Q&A function for your questions. Please direct any questions to the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. While we may not get to every question during our hour together, rest assured we'll review each one. Additionally, the chat feature is enabled for your comments and insights. Look for it right next to the Q&A box. Remember though, questions should go into the Q&A to ensure that they are properly addressed in that section. Please be informed that this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available to you afterwards. Also, we're broadcasting live on YouTube and the link will be shared in the chat once it becomes accessible. Thank you so much for your attention, so let's begin. Today's webinar will be facilitated by Eric Bruchemann, the CEO of the South African Capital Equipment Export Council. He's a mechanical engineer with a wealth of experience and has worked for the African Development Bank and the World Bank. Eric will facilitate the discussion with our panel, which consists of Mpo Mukwena, the Technical and Services Manager at Shell Lubricant South Africa, Tafadzwa Chibanguza, the COO at the Steel and Engineering Industries Federation of Southern Africa, Mervyn Naidu, the Group CEO at Actum, and Amit Singh, the National Manager for Manufacturing at Nedbank Commercial Banking. Before our discussion gets underway, I'd like to introduce Specialized Exhibitions Montgomery CEO, Gary Corrin. Specialized Exhibitions Montgomery is the organizer of the Electro Africa Mining Exhibition and a partner of this webinar. Electro Mining Africa takes place from 2 to 6 September. I'll hand over to Gary, who will share more information. Hi, Shannon. Thank you. And uh, what a privilege for me to be a part uh, of today's webinar. Uh, just on behalf of Specialized Exhibitions Montgomery, I'd like to thank Crema Media, SACEC, and all the esteemed panelists uh, today that are participating. Um, you know, it's really a, a privilege to be uh, in, a, in a small way, just a part of, of local manufacturing in South Africa. Just from Electromining Africa perspective, um, this year's show, which is from the 2nd to the 6th of September here at NASREC, um, I'm very, very proud to announce is going to be the largest uh, in its history. Uh, going back 52 years, there's 39,000 square meters, net square meters of exhibit space, uh, 950 exhibitors, and a whopping 96% of those are local South African companies based here in South Africa. Uh, we will have a few internationals from Southeast Asia, Europe, uh, North America uh, displaying their wares, but it is essentially a South African brand and a South African platform for trading in uh, the mining, industrial, manufacturing uh, sectors of the South African economy. This year, uh, an added attraction is the local manufacturing expo, which is being held in Hall 10. Uh, we're very excited about that initiative and all of that that, that promises to uh, showcase uh, for the South African economy. Um, there's a, an interesting stat uh, from the Center for Exhibition Industry Research in, in, in North America. Um, they show that over, uh, I think it's about five, five decades of research that on average, um, every visitor that comes through the, the doors to an exhibition, at least one of those visitors comes on a ticket that's been invited uh, or an invite by an exhibitor and the balance, uh, the other visitor comes through uh, on an invite from, from the organizer. So it's a collective team effort. And statistically, that means that this year's show is bound to attract more than the, substantially more than the 30,000 trade visitors we had two years ago. So a lot to be excited about. A lot of uh, positive anticipation and, uh, yeah, like I said, uh, in, in some small way, just uh, a privilege for us to be a part of a catalyst uh, in, in, in the context of South African manufacturing and uh, doing a little bit to, to bring buyers and sellers together uh, to, to see the latest technology, to see the latest offerings uh, and to see a, a world-class show. The show is the second largest of its kind uh, in the world. And once again, 
Uh, just really proud to be South African, if I may, because um, I know we have international participants as well. But, you know, even in the Olympics, I see we've won a gold medal as well. So just in our small way, we we can operate at a, at a, at a, at a quality level. And, uh, yeah, the, the event should hopefully be a world-class showing. So from our side, thank you for the opportunity to, to express that, to invite everybody to the show. Anybody that wants to come, you're welcome. Uh, and yeah, from our side, thank you for the opportunity to be a, a part of today. Thank you, Shannon. Thanks very much, Gary. I'll hand over to Eric now and he'll start the discussion with our panelists. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Gary, and thanks, Prima Media. Um, welcome to the show. Thank you to the uh, panelists for giving up their time. Um, first of all, I would like to just introduce SACIC, which is the South African Capital Equipment Export Council. And SACIC provides a facilitating role in assisting the capital equipment, the machinery and equipment engineering sector companies to grow their business through exporting. Um, we've grown our exports in South Africa, exports of machinery equipment, capital equipment to just over 205 billion rand a year. And I must say, um, when we talk about um, the exhibition, the electro mining exhibition and all the advertising that gets done, we find a trend that um, after an exhibition like Electro Mining Africa, the over a period of 18 months, the exports do go up. So it shows you how important it is for people to attend an exhibition like this and to get the orders. And that's what happens in engineering it's still a very much a people versus people. People want to meet people and people want to see touch and feel product. And of course, at the electro mining, um, you've got the best of the best local South African manufacturers showing off, showcasing their goods. Um, on that note, I just want to give a quick background to the manufacturing sector and where we stand at the moment. Um, it is no surprise to tell you that our manufacturing sector has declined over the years. And I'll just, over the past 25 years, in the year 2000, South Africa employed roughly 2.9 million people in the manufacturing sector. But you must remember at that stage, we also only had a population of about 38 million in 2023, um, our, our sector employed approximately 1.5 million people, and we've got a population of approximately 67. So you can do the maths yourself and see where we are. Some of the provinces in South Africa have more employable people unemployed than employed. And this is where it becomes very important in the manufacturing sector to start and having a look at what are the the options we have to increase our manufacturing sector. And the unemployment rate in South Africa is about 34.9 or 35%. This, of course, creates another problem. And we have it that if you have a look at our township economic or our informal sector, um, and I was reading articles about this, is that our informal sector employs approximately 7 million people and their turnover, the, the amount of money they spend in the informal sector is about 75 billion rand per year. And this has its own problems because obviously they're not contributing um, to the system that they are supposed to be contributing. And it's an informal sector. And the second problem that we have in South Africa, of course, and why we see our decline is because we have a lot of imports. And our imports, what the imports in reality mean is that we employ people overseas. We employ people in other countries manufacturing goods for us in South Africa. And of course, the inflation to that means that it is all rand, dollar or pound based. So basically, we're employing a lot of people overseas, which we should be employing locally in South Africa. And we will go through this, and there are a whole lot of questions I will ask the panelists. Uh, but that is just to give you a short background of where we are. 
So my first question is going to be to Amit Singh from Nedbank. Um, and, and the question I've got, South Africa manufacturers have been on a decline for several years. How can this trend be turned around? Give us your thoughts on this, Amit. Yeah, Eric, so thanks. Thanks for the opportunity and uh, thanks for the question. I think as you painted the picture now in the last, let's call it two decades or so, we've seen a rapid decline. Uh, I want to say up front, there's definitely no silver bullet to fixing where we're going from a manufacturing perspective. I think uh, it's a culmination of a few activities, actions, decisive actions that need to be taken. Uh, and in no order of priority, you know, uh, in my view, uh, definitely policy regulation needs to be changed to be more supportive of the manufacturing space and sector. Uh, we've seen from past experiences when there's policy, when there's regulation and effort uh, that's put in from a government perspective, we are noticing those differences, i.e. the APDP, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, next, I uh, would look at stability. So you look at political stability. I think now with the GNU, we are looking at some really positive signs that, that could potentially come from this. We understand there's going to be a settlement period. Uh, but just as important, you know, what, what is now seems like a distant uh, pass for us as South Africans is load shedding. So grid stability, I believe, is an important thing to, to reignite our manufacturing space and sector. Uh, if you have a look at what has happened over the last couple of years with uh, the lack of supply, and how that's affected manufacturing has, has been tremendous. Um, another important point, I believe, um, Eric and team, is the, the production efficiencies. Uh, while South Africa has been, you know, much of a, let's call it, in, in cruise control or autopilot for the last 20 odd years or so, there has been advanced machinery developed, uh, developments, AI developments and the likes. And adoption of those advanced machinery production efficiencies, I believe, is key to getting us to our former glory. Uh, you also raise a very important point insofar as workforce and skill. You know, we import in skill at, at, at quite heavy prices, uh, not necessarily transferring those skills over, we import in goods at heavy prices. And I think it's about time we start reinvesting in our people within the manufacturing space and sector. Uh, you alluded to it earlier on, uh, you know, we are vibrant, uh, energetic South African individuals. And I do believe there's a tremendous amount of skill that we have within our country that we can uh, better tap into. Uh, definitely, you know, the, probably my last three points I want to make on this is there's definitely a need for infrastructure development. Uh, we noticing and seeing some nice developments that's happening with the Transnet, uh, you know, big loans to be taken out in improving our infrastructure. Again, I think we are a long journey from getting to where we need to be, um, but I do take a, a certain amount of confidence insofar as they, they ease uh, an intent to improve our infrastructure and logistic lines. Um, two last points from my side. Um, we need to also understand that collaboration is key. The responsibility of reviving uh, our activity in manufacturing is not one of private sector. It's not one of public sector. I do believe that key to getting us to where we rightfully deserve to be is collaboration between all sectors, industry players and stakeholders uh, for the betterment of our country. We need to stand for something in Africa, in the world, on the global landscape in terms of manufacturing. And it's key and critical that we define that and define that together to the benefit of our country. Thanks, Mervyn. Yeah, that, but I agree with you. That, that's something that we have to do. And um, I do believe that we as South Africans are working towards that. My next question is to Umpu from Shell Lubricants. And the question is how best can local manufacturers reduce the environmental footprint and improve efficiency in general? What is your experience on that? Thanks, Eric. Um, uh, good afternoon to fellow panelists and uh, our audience um, on, in the meeting. Um, Shell uh, generally is uh, on a trajectory to achieve a net zero carbon footprint. Uh, by 2050, you know, Shell Lubricant Solutions in particular plays a pivotal role um, as a strategic partner to the manufacturing sector, as we have touched points across all seg segments um, of the of the manufacturing sector. Um, you've gave us, uh, you know, a good background in terms of the decline that has been, you know, uh, noticed over the years, you know, and the recent one. A uh, recent report uh, from States SA is the 0.6% uh, decline, I think it was on Q1. 
And uh, most of the sectors, um, you know, basic or general steel, uh, motor vehicle sector, as well as transport. These are the se segments of manufacturing sector that's contributed, you know, a lot towards um, that decline. And coincidentally, these are the sectors where solutions to reduce carbon footprint um, are, are mostly required. Um, optimization of manufacturing processes. So that is that is our key approach in this sector, and it, it, it goes along with collaboration uh, that Amit uh, mentioned just now. Uh, collaborating with our partners uh, to cushion uh, the impact of external factors um, on their bottom line. Um, so we work hand in hand with our customers, and I said, you know, Shell Lubricant Solutions. Um, we are already supplying uh, products and solutions, uh, especially on the product side, um, that are already carbon neutral. And this is a direct benefit uh, to our customers in uh, achieving uh, their transition uh, to you know, uh, a lower carbon footprint um, across their manufacturing processes. Thanks, Impu. And I think if you have a look at it, especially our panelists, and I just like to say that even Shell and Nedbank, Actum and CIFSA are all leading the industries pretty well in South Africa at the moment. And it just goes to show if you listen to the comments made, the positiveness that you have um, and, and the good work that everybody is doing. And my next question is to Mervyn Naidu from Actom, is how would you describe the demand for locally produced products, current trends, and over the past few years, and what factors are supporting this trend? Mervyn, floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, Eric, uh, fellow, fellow panelists, as well as uh, webinar participants. Uh, so, Eric, uh, my view is that, uh, first, the infrastructure spend has generally been depressed over the past few years, and we see that uh, by way of the fixed capital formation uh, numbers. You know, I think fixed capital formation in the country over the past 10 years dropped from about 20% to, you know, down to about 12%. Um, and with that, you know, the country's been primarily on a, uh, call it an aftermarket um, uh, uh a type uh, uh, economy with, with depressed capital investment. In saying that, uh, where we sit today, the uh, power generation um, in the country sits between 30 to 35 gigawatts of power being generated. Uh, there is demand beyond that, and the demand is projected to increase. And with that, there's uh, you know also the migration towards renewable energy, uh, where some of the older uh, power plants, your coal-based power plants, get retired and uh, and there's a migration towards renewable energy. So there's a demand for um, you know, new power generation projects in the renewable sector as well as other uh, uh, fuels. And uh, it, you know, one of the key things with that is that um, these new power projects are scattered across the country. Uh, the current transmission network is concentrated uh, primarily around one province called Mpumalanga. So in order to unlock the potential of these new renewable projects and IPP projects, um, there's going to be a massive need for investment into the transmission infrastructure of the country. And, uh, and I think the estimates are some, uh, a build program of about 14,000 kilometers of transmission line, approximately 170 transmission uh, substations. And all of these initiatives is going to change the trend um, when it gets to demand for manufactured product. Um, and, uh, you know, our expectation is that we see a massive, uh, you know, um, projection in terms of demand going forward over the next 20 years plus, um, and that will ultimately stimulate manufacturing in the country. Thanks, Mervyn. Yes, I, I agree. And we need, we need electricity and we need water and we need the infrastructure to be there. And I think that, uh, if you have a look at the whole over the last several months without um, any power failures or any shortages, um, when you speak to industry, they're much happier. And, and I think the productivity has gone up because there's nothing worse than a shortage of supply. And that leads me on to the next question for Tafazwa from the steel and engineering industries. And the question is, 
How are South African manufacturers adapting to the country's energy, water, and logistic crisis? Over to you, to yeah, good, good afternoon, Eric, and to the fellow panelists and to the participants of the webinar. Um, Eric, um, representing a federation, obviously, I'll speak for a collective of companies. You are representing approximately 1,300 companies. So um, there's a number of touch points that one could touch on. But I think in, in, in answering the question, there's one very recent example, which I think is relevant to this, which describes the problem. But then also later on, I'll touch on the need. And that was a, um, a, a, a multinational um, company, a valve manufacturer operating out in the east of uh, Johannesburg, who recently um, failed what was an ad hoc infra, um, insurance audit. Um, and the failure, the provisional failure that was really was on the back of uh, the, the water suppression system, which is based on, um, which was grid supplied water. Uh, failed to deploy during this audit because there was no water in the in the or, or on the it was being supplied by, by the grid, and obviously the response by that company, which was the insurance condition, was then to invest approximately twelve million rand um, to then um, so to put in place a backup water suppression or fire suppression system at a, at a substantial cost of twelve million rand. Um, we also sometime last year at the height of load shedding also did a survey on what members were. Um, investing in terms of alternative energy supply, a lot of that was going into gen sets, about 67% of about the 200 megawatts that were employed, uh, that were deployed across the board. Um, um, we're, we're going 67% of that was going into gen sets. So the point really is that companies are responding by stepping in and doing and supplying or providing for themselves those areas where crisis is, mani where is manifesting. That obviously presents a number of problems in itself. Uh, firstly, and the obvious one is the capital allocation opportunity cost for these companies, um, because that is money that could have been elsewhere spent in investing in operations, which now obviously goes, um, which which now goes into fixing what should have been a public good, and a and a more, um, a secondly and 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 less in your face, but also important, is the Reserve Bank has. He, repeatedly highlighted the impact that administered prices are having on um, the country as a whole. Um, in fact, if you look at the latest reading of the of the administered price inflation, it's running about just, un just under double inflation. So the point really is that the impact of all these inefficiencies are then breeding in cost. And the issue really is that the end consumer is, is ultimately the one who pays for that, uh, for that inefficiency and for the solutions that these private sector companies have to then step into and, and, and deploy. But, uh, and I'll, I'll leave it on this and I'll, happy, I'll be happy to unpack it because we are, we, are, we are in the process of finalizing a piece of work that also describes the fact that while the current infrastructure decay presents a major problem, which I've described already, and yes, infrastructure spend in terms of the big capital projects are important for long-term industrialization, there's also, there's also an important discussion that needs to be had at an intermediate level that you actually can run a massive scale um, industrialization project just by repairing and rebuilding the current infrastructure. Um, we've done some work in the water area and the type of investments that you'd be looking at from a refurbishment and repair um, on the electricity side, Mervyn has spoken about the transmission network as well, as well as some work as well on, on Transnet um, or, or on the logistics side, not just Transnet. And I mean, some of the numbers that we are coming um, to would be looking at in the order of um, excess of 100 billion rand a year investment across these three areas, of course, just on refurbishment. And that's on a medium term basis. So therein lies a bit of an opportunity for for intermediate industrialization, if you like. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Dr. Fesper. Um, it, it, it's, I mean, it, it's amazing. And, and if you have a look at it, if we do just have to repair the infrastructure that we've got in South Africa, um, that would create an enormous amount of work for an enormous amount of people. And, and hopefully we can get the right people to do it. Um, and that we don't import people to do this kind of work and we do it locally. And that brings me to the next question for uh, Emma. And, and that is from, from Medbank. Um, 
what innovation financing solutions does NetBank offer to help South African manufacturers expand their operations? Uh, Eric, thanks. Um, so I want to touch a little bit on, on, on innovative solutions, but I think more important than innovative solutions, we need to understand as to where we are um, in the finance slash financing cycle of banks. Um, I think it's gone with the days where banks are providing off-the-shelf solutions to any particular client or business out there. These unprecedented times that we've seen, you know, particularly elevated and, and further exacerbated since COVID has been astronomical. So, you know, uh, since then, we've had a whole host of things from Russian ships to, to uh, you know, wars, uh, Trump sagas and so on and so forth. So, you know, there's been a lot of instability, both micro and macro level. And for us, as, as a responsible responsible bank, to give off-the-shelf shelf solutions to any particular business out there, be it manufacturing or not, will be irresponsible of us to do that. So, you know, I think one thing that we pride ourselves at quite closely, um, Eric and team, is that prior to even getting involved in, in the manufacturing sector, we've taken some time out to actually uh, understand what are the nuances with the space, uh, understand what is keeping our clients up at night, what, what are the press points for them? And that's basically on, on how we uh, founded and developed and designed our solutions and our offerings to this particular space. You know, I'll give you, I'll give you um, an example, probably, probably the best way to explain it. And I think it was a question or a comment that was made with regards to uh, renewable energy and sustainability and how do we go about funding and financing this. Um, and it was that in mind that NetBank understood at that point, it wasn't necessarily critical that we only play a role as funders but also aid and assist our clients in navigating uh, going off grid or whatever solution they might require. Uh, and us not being you know, the specialist in electricity or alternative energy, we actually at that stage partnered with a company to aid and assist uh, our clients insofar as what alternative solutions do they have in terms of electricity. And it was through those initiatives that we not only uh, aided and assisted our clients in funding solutions that's appropriate, fit for pocket, fit for business, but also assisted in providing the right solution for that particular business. So, you know, uh, product solutions is not necessarily uh, the be all and end all. I think it's understanding the particular nuance with that business. Uh, and there could be a various factors, a various amount of factors that play into it. Thanks, Emmett. I was, my next question, I'm actually going to go to uh, Mervyn from. Uh, Tom. And it's a stupid question, but it's a very valid question, valid question, and we need to ask this question. And, and people might say, you know, this, this sounds like a common sense thing, but it's not so much. And, and the question, Mervyn, is why is manufacturing so important given the contents of the South African economy, social economy? Um, can, you, can you give us an answer to that? Your yes. opinion. Yes, Eric. So, so my view, you, you know, when you look at firstly the demand that does exist, you know, given the the scale of what needs to be done um, in the sector, um, uh, 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 you know, when you look at manufacturing over the years, it's declined as a percentage of GDP, um, you know, as a contribution to GDP in the country. And for me, when you look at the scale of demand that's uh, in the, that's that's uh, here and uh, needed for the future, you know, for me, it's so crucial that. Uh, Firstly, as a country, we sit with a massive unemployment crisis. A youth unemployment, you know, I think from the age group 20, 18 to 24, sits close to 70%. Um, and, and for me, we need to use this demand, leverage of this demand to uh, create localization opportunities where we employ, uh, you know, local people, uh, manufacture um, and benefit SA Inc. at large. And in so doing, we actually increase the economically active population in the country. You reduce the, uh, you know, the basic income, income grant and social burden on the state. You get people more economically active and through that, um, help GDP growth, stimulate our economy. And when you look at South Africa, you know, historically, um, a, a lot of infrastructure uh, projects, whether it be in the logistics side, on rail, on ports, um, in the power generation, transmission, and distribution sectors, uh, you know, historically, a lot of that product was localized, locally manufactured. And for me, I think it's the perfect opportunity to leverage up the demand that does exist to help resuscitate our economy, to, do, to reindustrialize our economy, 
and thereby uh, facilitate GDP growth, but turn around the current social economic crisis that we sit with as a country. And that's the one consideration. The other key thing as well is that, you know, when you look at manufacturing, uh, it, through localization, uh, you have an element of, uh, you know, skills transfer uh, and that across various elements. And uh, and for me, what's key is that you develop the skills that are ab- able to also support the aftermarket of the product, to maintain the product. And, and for me, that's a key uh, consideration in any investment where you need to look at total life cycle cost and the fact that you're able to support the product uh, in, in the country. And that, for me, is key. And manufacturing can be, uh, you know, that platform uh, to help, uh, you, you know, uh, solve some of the, our country's problems. Thank you very much. Yeah, my next question is going to be to Impu from uh, Shell. And the question is, how are Shell's industrial and commercial lubricant products supporting the sustainability of South Africa? And what products does Shell have in the pipeline and are the potential benefits for local manufacturers? Two questions in one, Mpoo, but I'm going to ask them both as a <laughs> hand in hand. Hey, thanks, Eric. Um, well, I'll start with the first one. I think Tefazo mentioned a very key aspect around operational efficiencies, um, you know, helping manufacturers um optimize their operations um you know shell lubricants solutions you know we've gone beyond um just being the commodity supplier um collaboration is also very one of our key elements anchoring our our solutions um collaboration sustainability and digitization for optimization because it has a direct impact on um you know companies within uh, the manufacturing sector and and helping our partners, uh, customer partners, reduce um, their maintenance spent, you know, reduce their total cost of operations, you know, has a direct impact on their profitability and thus turning around uh, their output uh, in terms of uh, of production. I think when it comes to digitization, you know, some of our solutions like Shell Remote Sense, um, you know, we use data analytics um, to spot very early uh, potential failure to critical equipment um, and thus, uh, you know, avoiding costly, um, you know, unplanned downtime. So that that is where, you know, as Shell Lubricant Solutions, we are positioned currently, you know, and that has also optimization has direct impact on your carbon footprint um, you know within uh, the overall value chain and we have seen the demand for sustainability products you know globally you know uh, it's forecasted you know about 11 percent uh, compounded annual growth rate up to 2027 and you know most manufacturers see this as a saving uh, to help them uh, sustain themselves, sustain their productivity and profitability. Um, and it, your sec- the second part of your question around the products in our portfolio, I think over the last two years, uh, Shell PLC has made some very strategic acquisitions uh, globally, which have become available for the South African market. Uh, I think it's 2022, Shell acquired Panolin Oil, uh, which is a Swiss oil company that uh, focuses and specializes on biodegradable lubricants, uh, which is now part of the Shell portfolio. Uh, in 2023, um, Shell acquired Madel and Mivolt that specializes in natural, fully synthetic um, ester transformer fluids. Um, and also we acquired Daystar, which uh, specializes in um, the generation of clean energy through solar system. I think this on its own signifies um, the intent and commitment, um, Shell, um, not only to support uh, local manufacturing companies, but in uh, transitioning to net zero carbon footprint um, over the next 15 to 20 years. Um, over and above that, you know, we are in the final stages of you know, talking to very critical uh, stakeholders, partners locally to introduce specialized uh, waste oil collection systems, uh, which focuses on secularity. Uh, and all of this is to the benefits of our customers. Um, you know, the key objective of, you know, in terms of shell lubricant solutions 
is to help our partners um, reduce their total spend uh, on the maintenances, um, you know, reducing, uh, you know, improving the total cost of operations and thus improving their profitability. Um, as I said, we way beyond just being a commodity supplier. We look at the solutions and partnering with uh, customers uh, end to end. Thank you. Yes, well, okay, that uh, is very much involved, as is the rest. Um, my next question is to, uh, to Francois, and that is, are initiatives aimed at encouraging the use of local content in projects providing, uh, providing effectiveness? Yeah, thanks, uh, Eric. I, I think when, when one looks at that question, um, the distinction has to be made between uh, private demand and public demand. Um, on the public side, um, you can legislate for it, right, in the form of, for example, writing a designation note um, that state organs will buy X with X local content. That's uh, that's fairly straightforward, although we've gone through uh, uh, a very dry period or gray period, if you like, where the public procurement bill only signed now um, has been um, in the production, if you like, for the better part of, of the last two years, which in that time, the interim regulations that were holding, that were holding fort during that time, um, allowed for anything and in, for, for state organs to, to either buy by importing or locally, right? There was no strict prescriptions around how they procure. So that is one area that uh, put now with the public procurement bill, as well as the designation discussion um, there, you can legislate for. On the private sector side, and this is where I think a shift in the mindset is needed in that there one legislating for it is very, um, it, it's practically almost nearly impossible for the simple fact that a uh, private capital will flow where it's easiest to either procure from or or or, or, or yeah procure from and and why I make that distinction is because for example if we look what happened in the uh, mining sector where there was an attempt to follow a stick approach uh, to mining procurement um, that piece of instrument landed up in the court and then obviously ended up being set aside so that's where I then highlight that I think in that area there needs to be a critical reform in the thinking around incentives so be it incentives around um, um, write-offs for buying for the extent of local content procurement etc um, where you actually create a business case for private sector companies to buy local I think there you could have something so sustainable that you would have um, a private uh, demand looking at uh, looking at buying uh, local um, but legislating for that area becomes very difficult um, on the public procurement side of course as I mentioned that's where we now go into the public procurement bill and we welcome the uh, provisions for designation specifically because that historically did work to support some industries across the metals and engineering value chain and uh, we see it also playing a, an important role um, the, uh, for state organs to play an important role in supporting demand. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that, um, you know, the, the preferred procurement and, and buying from local manufacturers is a big thing in South Africa. And if you have a look at the spend that our state-owned companies have and that they're spending, including the local municipalities, if we could just transform that instead of importing um, and buying from local suppliers, whether they're small local suppliers or big local suppliers, and I'll talk about that just now because we had a question on that, um, that would make a huge difference and that will grow the economy um, exponentially um, instead of just keep on on the import side. But my question now for Amazon. Um, Eric. Ed, but, sorry, yes. Sorry, man. Be before proceeding, just just uh, I think on, on two points uh, to go back to. I think Mervyn was asked a question on the importance of the manufacturing space and sector, and I just want to um, you know add my voice into 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 that aspect. And I believe Mervyn touched on it very well. Uh, but to 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 further exaggerate it, you know, I think quite often as South Africans we are accused of being followers and not leaders, and we have a lag effect uh, in our country relative to what's happening globally and with other developing or developed countries. Um, and this we could use to our benefit or advantage. We've seen from experience 
uh, our our BRICS countries. We've seen uh, Rwanda. We've seen uh, you know various Cameroon, etc. Various other countries that are uh, utilizing manufacturing as the gateway from developing into developed countries. So you know further than just the GDP contribution, employment, jobs, uh, less pressure on government, and so on and so forth. Uh, if we are really to own, you know, our rightful place again, uh, I'll make mention, I do believe the gateway is through manufacturing. We've seen this being played out in many other developing countries that are now powerhouses from a global landscape perspective. And with South Africa having uh, developed infrastructure that does require investment, I appreciate that. But where we stand uh, as formerly being the gateway to, to, to Africa, um, there's a massive opportunity that we have on the table. Uh, with regards to manufacturing and re reinvigorating that sector, uh, you know, to develop into where, you know, where we could potentially be. Um, that's the one point. The other one, uh, the, the comments that were made or some, some comment that was made a short while ago about, you know, our import costs and, and where we import in from. Uh, can we, nest? there was a comment also on, you know, on the chat that was made relative to, can we compete with the likes of China, et cetera? Um, and I do believe that in many instances, we can compete with, with any country for that matter and doing so responsibly. So, you know, feeding back into the circular economy, ensuring that we're doing so in, in, in the right respect of, of mankind, uh, climate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the one point I want to make is, is that we also as South Africans in our individual capacities, as well as our businesses, uh, should take the responsibility upon ourselves to stop associating uh, quality with country. Uh, and I say this very often, is that uh, back in the day, if you were to buy a car or purchase a vehicle, uh, you would buy from a particular country, uh, a German vehicle, you know, where Italian suits, eat with Swiss chocolate and, and all these, let's call it cliches. Uh, I, I want to clearly stipulate that, that, you know, if we have a look at our production facilities, our manufacturing plants that we have in South Africa, we are major players in this space. These are world-class production facilities. And as each one of us as South Africans, you know, we need to stop associating um, uh, quality with country. We, we do have quality here. Uh, and, and, and if we all support locally uh, in our individual capacities and in our business capacities, I believe that just that small change in mindset can fundamentally shift our local development, our local research and development, uh, and our local economy with regards to manufacturing. Thanks, uh, Eric. No problem. Thank you, Amit, for that. And I, and I can just add from my uh, <clears throat> South African Capital Equipment Export Council, um, we obviously have a look at the exports and what the exports are doing, and we have a look at our members. And I can, I can say without any doubt that all our members are world-class manufacturers. And if you see their manufacturing plants and what they do, um, and in my opening remarks, I was mentioning that... Um, and just in the machinery and equipment, capital equipment, um, we are exporting over 205 billion rand a year of goods. Um, and that, that is amazing because most of it is, is based on specialized equipment and, and designed equipment, and then it's not in the mass production. And I fully agree with you, uh, Amit, that when you look at, at the clothing, when you look at cups and saucers, when you look at anything, knives, forks, you know, the industry is so big, we should be manufacturing all of this stuff ourselves, and we should not be looking at imports. And when I look at our members, um, none of them stand back to any international competitor. As a matter of fact, we, we are very successful in the international market. But saying that, I want to go now to uh, Mervyn and ask Mervyn the question, as an industry leader and the largest manufacturing solution provider, repair and distributor of electromechanical equipment in Africa, which sectors has ASCOM identified, uh, ACTOM, sorry, identified as having the potential for local content and the biggest? Mervyn? Yeah, yes. Uh, thank you, Eric. Eric, I also just want to comment on, on the points placed by yourself and Amit before you are answering your question. In fact, it will lead into you into the answer uh, for your question. So, so for me, uh, so firstly, the ACTOM group in March this year employed uh, approximately 8,500 people in five countries. We actually export products globally, you know, uh, medium voltage motors into North America, uh, boilers into uh, many parts of the world. and uh, you know, the fact is we, we're 121 years old and have been doing it for many years. And I think very often South African companies underestimate, uh, you know, the capability of, of engineering uh, in the country 
and in the continent as well. You know, so for me, it's something that uh, you know there's huge potential from an export perspective, um, and, and I think we need to leverage off that and uh, and maximize and grow on that. You know, um, in terms of Acton, what we've identified as key markets, um, you know, and it goes back to my earlier point when you look at um, uh, the power generation sector, the need for um, you know for the increase in generation capacity. Uh, and the, the resultant need in the extension of uh, transmission and distribution capacity, um, you know, that uh, together with the fact that we've got backlogs in logistics, you know, whether it be rail, ports. And, and for me, you know, we've identified major opportunities, firstly, from a generation perspective, in, you know, by way of uh, manufacture product, uh, going into the likes of your, your wind farms, your concentrated solar plants, your uh, solar plants, your biomass, uh, and these could be anything from boilers uh, to turbines to alternators to, um, uh, you know, alternators used on the wind turbines, your solar panels, uh, inverters, batteries, you know, so massive opportunities in the um, in the uh, power generation sector. From a transmission and distribution sector, you know, there's uh, the potential for uh, products like transformers, uh, high voltage uh, equipment, you know, these are high voltage disconnects, instrument transformers, uh, protection and control systems, um, uh, switch gear, ring main units. So, you know, a, a whole range of products. And, uh, and for me, all of these products, you know, can be localized, um, you know, and uh, it has been uh, over many years and it creates the perfect platform, uh, you know, for, um, uh, for the country to to uh, uh, to accelerate the economic growth. Um, thank you. Thanks, Mervyn. And that that that's for the questions. Now we're going to look at some of the questions that uh, our viewers have asked. And I'm going to go. We're going to do a few questions. And one of the viewers asked, but sorry, I'm going to ask every one of the panelists to give a minute of their thought on each of this before we go. We've got roughly. 10 or 12 minutes uh, left. Uh, and, and the one question is, how do we promote our small micro businesses into becoming a formal business and growing? How do we, what do we do to help them? And let me just go straight to Emma. Can you give us a, your opinion on that, please? Yeah, I think it's critical to understand in any business is firstly to understand that particular business uh, what are their aspirations and what market do they want to play in? Um, what does that supply chain look like? What are those offtake you know, agreements look like? So again, to the only point I made, I don't think there's necessarily a silver bullet uh, to assist any business out there. And I think that's what often gets us into trouble. Uh, but promoting small businesses, we need to understand what, where do they want to play? What is that aspiration? What is the growth pathway? And as banks specifically, we've got an important role is how do we partner with their client to achieve their aspirations in a responsible manner. Um, and again, you know, I'll, I'll go back to the fact that when it comes to, you know, call it product solutions and those type of things, any bank, any, you know, anyone offers the same. Uh, key and critical is to understand uh, where, where is this business currently placed? Uh, where do they want to get to? And, and, and how then do we bridge those gaps in that client journey? And maybe from a traditional banking perspective or even beyond banking solutions, because uh, quite often is the case, as with the example I gave earlier on with, with some of the solutions uh, with alternative energy, uh, as banks, we could not be the experts or potentially not the experts in the client's needs and requirements. But how do we then serve as a conduit to get that client to those experts that they need to ensure, uh, you know, their growth, development and sustainability for the foreseeable future. We have a tremendous vantage point as banks that we get to see uh, the environment uh, across the country uh, through a number of different sectors and clients. And we should be utilizing that information to the benefit of these SMEs and, and aid and assist them in growing their businesses to the point that they would like to eventually be at. Great. Thanks, Amit. I'm going to go over to the Fazwa from Steve. So can you respond to that question? Yeah, th thanks, Eric. I I'll answer that from the perspective of an industry body, where I think uh, our small to medium um, enterprises sometimes overlook the importance of uh, being part of an industry body. Um, and in this case, this is not necessarily punting up CIFSA, but it's the Export Council, uh, SAKIK, um, because in an industry body, 
um, you then have access to the larger companies, um, the actoms of the world, just from a network point of view, um, as well as from an exchange of an ideas point of view, because your question was, how do we migrate them from small to large? Because I think even at that micro level um, company, the, if you like, hard infrastructure solutions they have, um, the intelligence to develop concept to product is there, but it's sometimes how you navigate the soft infrastructure um, aspects of um, uh, policy, of um, access to um, understanding, um, research, etc. Um, and and in one instructive example by one of our once smaller companies once once made the point that a small company is unlikely to be able to afford uh, an economist, for example, in their organization. But through an industry body, they then have access to that. So I I would. I would make that point from my perspective, um, also given the, the fact that I'm sitting in an industry body. And I think that's one critical avenue that one industry bodies can play, but also small and medium enterprises should look to um, industry bodies as an avenue to, to navigate the broader landscape. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, Dr. Yes, we've, at Tech, we've done that and we've been very successful in taking some very small companies and um, mentoring them. And, and especially going to local exhibitions like the Electromining Africa. And that's why we got the LME at it as well, where we take young companies, up and coming companies, and we introduce them to the bigger guys. And we, we, we facilitate and make sure that they, they don't get an order that's too big that will go make them bankrupt. So we've done a lot of this work and we will continue doing this. Um, let me ask uh, Mervyn. Yeah, I, I, I think Eric, you know, on on that question, I, I think for me it's it's so uh, important that we have inclusive growth, you know, and SMMEs are a are key to uh, towards uh, us reducing the unemployment crisis that we sit uh, within the country. And and how do you get to develop SMMEs? And 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 for me, it's about saying, you know, how do we use infrastructure projects, localize, and and you know, kind of develop your supplier base as well. Um, you know, uh, we, we, you go through various programs, incubation programs, and I, and I think these things are absolutely crucial where you look at, uh, you know, all stakeholders, inclusive growth, and, and thereby turn around the current situation that we have in the country, you know. So, uh, and, and for me, I think once you stimulate economic growth in that, uh, these things will uh, correct. And when I look at the scale of what's needed in the country, you know, it's, no, it's a no-brainer that there will be many opportunities created for SMMEs. And, and Eric, while I, I just talk about that, I maybe just want to talk about very briefly about your um, about the Africa continental free trade area as well. You know, it I think just, can I comment on that? Yes, please do. Yeah. So, so you know, uh, one of the key things we need to look at uh, as a continent is, is in, you know, when you look at um, uh, capital goods. You know, um, firstly, there's a lot of steel that goes into capital goods. Um, the iron ore uh, that goes into that steel, um, there's a lot of it mined in, in, in the continent. The copper that goes into capital goods, you know, your transformers, your electric motors and that, uh, that ore, a lot of it's mined in, in Africa as well, you know, around the copper belt in many African countries and so too many other minerals. And, and for me, the key approach we need to adopt is to say, how do we benefit uh, the minerals on the continent and 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 actually uh, create capital goods. And when you look at Africa as a continent, the Africa Continental Free Trade uh, Area and Free Trade Agreement is basically one that uh, starts towards effectively creating one market where you consolidate demand across the continent. And 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 when you look at the African continent, you know, relative to China, I think we generate about ten percent of the generation capacity at the moment of what China generates uh, for a very similar population. And I think over the next 20 years or so, it's projected that the, the economically active population in Africa will overtake that uh, of China, um, you know, over the next 20 years plus. And, uh, and why is that relevant? You know, it, it's because of the age profile of, of the African population. And, you know, with that growing economically active population, it will trigger demand for power generation, for data, for transmission and distribution of that power, for logistics. And for me, what's so key is that you use that demand to actually help localize, you know, where you, you know, embrace local economies, uh, embrace local people, employ local people, and thereby 
you know, help create GDP growth across all countries, you know, and I think that's the kind of approach we need to adopt, you know, in Africa Inc., where you, 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 you leverage of the demand on the continent uh, that benefit the people on the continent. I know that through the Electrical Export Council and ourselves, together with some other export councils, we're very big on this Africa Inc., incorporating Africa and trying to, to do a lot of work in Africa and grow it. But I need to go back to Umpu. I know that Shell is very much involved. And to go back to the original question on the small uh, business, Umpu, can I have your comments, please? Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, you know, having just mentioned beneficiation, um, uh, economic uh, inclusivity and uh, bene beneficiation, you know, as Shell, we look at it at micro level. Uh, meaning in, um, you know, in areas where we operate uh, through customer partnerships. Uh, they, for us, that is the kickstart um, to the turnaround um, in the manufacturing sector. Um, you know, a lot of what we do, you know, we're intentional about including, um, you know, local SMMEs in our project. Uh, but we don't only do that uh, such that we, we create a second layer of procurement. Uh, we do that to develop sustainable businesses uh, in local communities, um, uh, you know, where, where in, even if we're not part of those communities, uh, the local SMEs can still survive. Um, it's something that we're intentional about. It's uh, you know, something that we, you know, I mentioned the partnership and collaboration with customers. Um, in any partnership we go into uh, with customers, you know, we make that very clear as part of um, uh, benefiting and, and, and including local communities um, in the development of their local communities. So localization uh, for us, we look at it at that level, at micro level, where we operate and where we are actively involved with our clients um, in developing and upskilling um, local communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we got a couple of minutes left and before we go and hand it back to Sharon um, I'm just going to ask each panelist and please keep it short to a minute um, but the one question I think we need to ask is what does every panelist think we should do and I know that's uh, and who, how positive are we I'm very positive that we can we can fix what we need to fix so I'm going to ask every panelist just for a short one minute roundup of where we are with manufacturing and where we can go. And I'm going to start with uh, the Fatsuwa, please, from Sifsa. Yeah, all right. Thanks, Eric. Um, I think from our side, um, the, the, the way forward is a lot has been said, and I also mentioned it earlier on, about the current infrastructure decay creates an immediate offtake for repairing that infrastructure. And a number of the panelists have also spoken about that across all areas. So that is critical because if the economy is going to function, the infrastructure needs to function. On the supply side of that, we've got companies in the metals and engineering sector, and I'm, I'm sure it's across most manufacturing as well, who are operating at suboptimal levels of capacity utilization. Just to give you a sense, I mean, in electrical cables, we recently also did some piece of work where companies in that area are operating at about 42% capacity. So the idea is that in the build of the transmission network, those companies can increase supply with relatively small to little um, 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 uh, capital investment in terms of increasing production. And then lastly, I think what is important to take advantage of is one identifies that the political economy environment now has shifted to allowing for more private sector participation across the board. Uh, we see it with the regulations Treasury is looking at from uh, PPP, uh, uh, public-private partnerships and financing of projects. And I think the collective of those, where those three circles um, intersect is, is really a critical point to drive industrialization and manufacturing. So that will be our submission from our end, Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Umpu, from your side, your closing remarks. One minute, please. Yeah, look, I think if you look at the performance of the manufacturing sector in general, you know, sort of like a sine wave, um, you know, going up and down through you know, the last couple of years. Uh, so for me, that 
that uh, signifies um, the capacity to grow. Um, if we were to do a deep dive on that uh, performance, most of it will be linked uh, to infrastructure, you know, power challenges, you know, water challenges. If we can fix that, um, you know, from an uh, infrastructure point of view, I, I think we will be able to sustain and maintain um, you know, consistent growth within the sector, you know, that's not only going to uh, benefit, you know, local communities across the country, but, you know, economic stimulating economic growth in general. Um, so it, it comes down to, you know, having reliable infrastructure for our manufacturing companies to thrive in. Thank you so much for your comments. Uh, Mervyn from Acton. Yeah, Eric from my side, I, you know, I think when you look, when you reflect on uh, on uh, countries where economic growth rates have been high, uh, you tend to find that there's been, uh, you know, focus to to maximize on localization and local manufacture, you know, whenever there's infrastructure spend in that, you know. So for me, I think as ESA Inc., we need to do more of that. Um, in saying that, we also need to be very tactful, you know, that you, 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 there are products that you may not be competitive on, uh, you know, when you look at economies of scale and that. And I think you need to make a call to say, where are you competitive and where are you not competitive? And can you move into the sphere of competitiveness? If not, you know, partner potentially. Or, you know, so I think we need to look at very practically across different product lines in terms of, of what is the approach? What's the level of local content from a percentage perspective? Uh, but ultimately, the economics has to stack up as well. You know, we fully acknowledge that. But I think for me, the key thing is that we have the ability, you know, given the scale of demand that's coming to turn around the current situation economically and from a job creation perspective as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mervyn. I'm going to touch on what, what, what Mervyn has said, uh, is that in many spaces locally, we've seen a lot of success in manufacturing. And I think we need to put more focus into that. But more so than just that is take the lessons of success in that and why have these subsectors being successful, all these specific product ranges being successful, and can those lessons be applied to other subsectors of manufacturing? I think uh, I think that's one thing we don't do well enough um, uh, in South Africa, and, and definitely lessons we can take from that. Um, Eric and and panel members, and I think to the audience on the web, and I think very three or three very practical things for any business owners out there that that I'm noticing that are being successful for them, and and these guys are. What they do in the you know the successful guys in manufacturing or businesses of manufacturing are controlling the controllables, you know, staying close to what they can control and keeping the noise out in terms of what's happening that they can't control. Um, the second part of what they're doing is doing and doing it really well is ensuring that production efficiencies are at an all-time high and ensuring that they sweat in their assets at, at the absolute most, uh, as well as product uh, diversification. So, you know, with with production efficiencies. There's many instances where, where we've seen businesses that are diversifying their lines. Uh, and last but definitely not least, I, I think we don't necessarily make full use and benefit of some of the agreements we have in place. The Continental Free Trade Act, uh, we've got the AGOA agreement. Uh, I encourage businesses out there to see what has been put in place from a government policy uh, procedure perspective, regulatory perspective, that business owners can take advantage of to ensure that, that they can maximize, uh, you know, for their own benefit. And that's kind of my, my, my three takeouts and a little bit of uh, nuggets from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, yeah, from my side, uh, to all the listeners, thank you very much. Uh, to the panelists, thank you. I think um, it, it's been a very robust and you can see from the panelists that there's options. That everybody has got an option. I don't think anybody should give up on any sort of saying we can't do the manufacturing. Um, there's a lot of organizations out there. Um, and yes, it's going to take time, but I think if there's a will, there's a way. And anybody that has a will has never failed in their life before. And I think that's what the message that has come through today from um, our panelists is, guys, you need to be out there. You need to do it. Um, from big, massive organizations, but every organization starts off very small and grows from there. I don't think any business starts off very big and grows bigger, and, and that is one of the things. So for the for the South African local manufacturing, I think there's every opportunity. And uh, I also want to say that for everybody that's out there listening, please 
do come to the Electromining Africa and you'll see massive organizations and you'll see minute organizations all being successful. And I think that's one way to have a look at if you have got an idea of a business or if you are in business and not sure how to go forward, come to the Electromining Africa. That's where it's a showcase and, and you can set the standard from seeing what is happening there. So from my side, thank you to all the panelists. I really appreciate your time. And I'd like to now hand over back to Crema Media and to Shannon. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks very much, Eric. That brings us to the end of our webinar. I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you to our facilitator, Eric Brucherman, for enabling an engaging discussion. Thank you also to our panelists, Mpo Mukwena from Shell Lubricant South Africa, Tafadzwa Chibanguza from the Steel and Engineering Industries Federation of Southern Africa, Mervyn Naidu from Actum, and Amit Singh from Nedbank Commercial Banking. Thank you to our partner, Electromining Africa, and our sponsors, Nedbank, Shell, Seafsa, Actum, Donaldson, Hellerman Titan, Bova Safety Wear, Stratus Technologies, Pipestar, and Rare Plastics for their support in making this webinar possible. And finally, thank you to the attendees for taking the time to join us for this discussion on local manufacturing. We hope you found this event engaging and informative. We really appreciate your participation. The recording of today's webinar will be sent to you in due course. And if you have any additional questions, please be in touch. You can reach us at shannon at Thank you for your time and goodbye.